guys. I hope you're well. Um, my name is Anna Shodi. My name is Tito Alanio. And my name is Phoebe Kotler. Uh, we're here to give you a talk on racial inequalities in medicine and healthcare. Unfortunately, due to COVID-19, it can't be done in person. So we just wanted to show our faces and match them up to the voices. We hope you guys find this lecture informative and are really able to take out some of the key outcomes. We've given our emails that so that if you have any questions, please feel free to contact us. Um, and yeah, we hope you enjoy. Today we're giving you a talk on racial inequalities in medicine and healthcare and how does the UK health system impact the black patient. So 2020 has been short has not been short of surprises and unforeseen circumstances with global lockdowns keeping people across the globe in their homes and giving them time to reflect. The conscious world has begun to wake up and recognize the mistreatment of black people across the globe in all sectors. In the wake of the deaths of unarmed Americans, George Floyd, Floyd Breonna Taylor, Ahmad Arbery, individuals from all sectors have begun to realize the mistreatment, marginalization, explicit and implicit racism that black people experience across the globe. Unfortunately, the medical field is not immune to this. As a, revolve, as a result, we produced this lecture to recognize the racial history of medicine and its impact on current medical practice to identify current myths and medical misconceptions surrounding black and ethnic minority individuals and their consequences. To identify racial inequalities in health and give examples, i.e. COVID-19, maternal mortality and mental health. To explore the differences in medical education between black and minority ethnic groups and the effect this has on attainment. To develop strategies to target racial inequalities in medicine and healthcare and to identify strategies for creating a learning environment that is effective for all students, taking into account diversity and equality. So let's begin with painting a picture of our working environment. I understand that just under half of you listening will work in the HIMSS region. Here are the population demographics for the sites medical, nursing and midwifery students are working in whilst on placement from the 2011 census. What these statistics highlight is that black, Asian and ethnic minority BAME patients will make up a tiny fraction of the patients we encounter as students at HIMSS. Therefore, it is fundamental we are taught about BAME patient presentations in theory, as we're simply not seeing it in practice whilst on clinical placement. We need to diversify the way we approach teaching so that we consider all people from all backgrounds and not just tunnel in on a select few. This trend can be applied nationally, whereby unless students are working in major UK cities, they are much less likely to be meeting BAME patients whilst on community or hospital placement. Here are the population demographics in England, again taken from the 2011 census. When you take a step back, you can see whilst the majority of the population is still white, it is much less so than the HIMSS region. Certain areas of the UK are much more diverse compared to HIMSS. We're not all going to end up working in the HIMSS region. It's safe to say that almost all of us will at some point work in a more ethnically diverse area of the country, which is why the content of this lecture is pertinent in healthcare education. Think about your working environment, the students you teach and the patients you treat. How can you bridge the gap in order to be better serve both of these groups in, a way you in both the way you teach and how you practice? In order to understand what this lecture is about, we will need to go back to the beginning and look at the interaction between medicine and black patients. In Baltimore in 1835, Harriet Martineau was a French visitor who made a trip and found that the bodies of coloured people were exclusively being taken for dissection. Black people lacked the power to even protect the graves of their dead and their bodies were used by white scientists for experimentation. Dr. J. Marion Sims, now known as the father of gynecology, developed the first consistently successful operation for vesicovaginal fistula, a catastrophic complication of childbirth amongst 19th century American women. He carried out a series of experimental operations on black slave women between 1845 and 1849. He failed to use anesthesia whilst experimenting on black enslaved women, but once he had perfected his technique and moved to New York to found the women's hospital there, he routinely used anesthesia when operating on consenting white women. The Tuskegee syphilis experiments was a 40 year government study spanning from 1932 to 1972, in which 399 black men from Mason County, Alabama 
were deliberately denied effective treatment for syphilis in order to document the natural history of the disease. Now, whilst these events all occurred across the Atlantic, the practice of modern medicine is still based on these phenomena worldwide. So bringing those practices into the current day, recent studies have been conducted showing that lay people, medical students and doctors believe that black bodies are physically stronger with both thicker skin and blood than white bodies. Further research shows without a shadow of a doubt that the biological conceptions of race are consequential. Again, these are American studies. The fact that limited British research conducted on this phenomenon is massively problematic in itself. Unfortunately, something we do not have time to address in this talk. These are, some of, these are just some of the horrifying statistics I discovered whilst researching the topic of bias and pain treatment. Black patient pain scores are consistently underestimated by healthcare practitioners, resulting in them being less likely to receive analgesia, as exemplified by the middle statistics of extremity fractures and appendicitis in children. One study found that the size of difference of analgesia disparities in minorities raised quality and safety concerns. Unsurprisingly, this contributes to the fact BAME BAIN patients rightly feel their care is poor, leading to mistrust and dislike of healthcare professionals, affecting the doctor, nurse, midwife, dentist patient relationship. It will be a miss if we don't talk about the current pandemic that is COVID-19. The impact of COVID-19 on the Black community has been disproportionately severe. Black ethnic groups are most likely to be diagnosed with COVID-19 in comparison to white ethnic groups. And Black ethnic groups have the second highest rate of standardised deaths in confirmed cases per 100,000 population, according to the Public Health England study. A, sur a survey that was carried out by Rennie Mead Trust, also um, published in June, found that 19% of of people from Black African and Black Caribbean backgrounds know someone who has died from the virus. To say the least, 2020 has been an eventful year, but consider the toll this may have on your Black students alongside the ongoing racial toll and exposure from the Black Lives Matter movement and further um, overt racism. Carrying on COVID-19, mortality was 3.9 times higher than expected amongst Black males for this period and 2.7 to 2.8 times higher amongst Black mix and other females. A quote from the Public Health England report stated that COVID-19 did not create health inequalities, but rather the pandemic exposed and exacerbated long standard inequalities affecting BAME communities in the UK. If we consider the toll this had on NHS staff, Amongst all staff employed by the NHS, BAME individuals account for 21%, including approximately 20% amongst nursing and support staff, and 44% amongst medical staff. BAME individuals accounted for 63% of deaths amongst all staff, 64% of deaths amongst nursing staff, and 95% of deaths amongst uh, medical staff. BAME patients also accounted for 34% of the patients admitted to the UK intensive care units with COVID-19. But when we look at the UK population, only 17% of the UK is BAME. Um, if we consider factors why this may influence it, it's not just um, social inequalities. There's We have to consider the factors of historic racism, um, poor experiences and the fear of certain BAME colleagues um, not feeling the need that they can speak up if they don't have the right PPE, etc. If we consider the role of medical education, the BMJ found that medical schools in the UK are unprepared to deal with the racism and race, racial harassment experienced by Black and ethnic minority students. Last year, the Equality and Human Rights Commission reported that UK universities recorded just 560 complaints of racial harassment over three and a half years, although 60,000 students said that they had made a complaint. Ethnic minority backgrounds um, in medical school make up 13% of 13% of teaching staff, 40% of undergraduates, in comparison to 22% um, of normal um, university students. Racial harassment is seen as a contributing factor to the attainment gap observed between ethnic minority and white students and later between doctors. 
The BMJ's investigation also finds that lines of responsibility for medical students during clinical placements are not always clear. If we further ex um, explore this attainment gap, we see that doctors and medical students from ethnic minority backgrounds are up to three times as likely as their white counterparts to fail an examination. In 2017, the pass rate for postgraduate examinations was 75% amongst white students and 63% amongst UK ethnic minority students. This effect is also seen within the international medical graduates with 46% for white students and 42% for students from other ethnic backgrounds. As previously mentioned, this is not something that's just that stays within the role of education, but it carries on um, at the job aspect. The Royal College of Physicians um, reported that BAME doctors have been hindered in their search for senior roles because of widespread racial discrimination in the NHS. A report by the Royal College of Physicians found that 29% of white respondents are offered a post after being shortlisted for the first time in comparison to only 12% of BAME respondents. A 2018 study titled Earning by Ethnicity also found that black doctors in the NHS are paid on average almost £10,000 a year less and black nurses are paid £2,700 less than their white counterparts. This is not okay. This summer, we were flooded with headlines like these. From Vogue to The Independent, the racial gap in maternity care in the UK was being highlighted. You may have retweeted a tweet that looks like this or liked an Instagram post commenting on the shocking findings of the Embrace 2019 study for saving lives and improving mothers' care. The Embrace study found maternal deaths are not equally spread across the population. It found that Black, Asian and women from mixed backgrounds are more likely to die at a higher rate from maternal deaths than their white counterpart. If we take a closer look at the findings, Black women have more than a five times risk of dying in pregnancy or up to six weeks postpartum compared to white women. Women of mixed ethnicity are three times more likely and Asian women have twice the risk. Black women compared to white women are three times more likely to, to develop preeclampsia in their pregnancies. This isn't new news and this isn't solely a UK problem. This is a global issue. This doesn't just this just doesn't affect women from lower socioeconomic classes. In 2017, Serena Williams, following the birth of her daughter, felt unwell and collapsed and was later found to have a pulmonary embolism. Despite complaining to her doctors about feeling unwell and having severe chest pains, her complaints were not taken seriously. Two years later, one of the world's most notable artists and celebrities opened up about her complications she faced on delivery of her twins, including suffering with preeclampsia and toxemia. Despite fame and fortune, these two stories from black women are similar to thousands of other black women and women of color across the globe. The risk of maternal mortality among black and minority ethnic mothers in the UK has been disproportionately high and is increasing. From official figures by the Embrace project in 2015, maternal deaths per 100,000 maternities was 6.58 among white women and 28.17 among black women, meaning that black women face a more than four time risk of dying of maternal death between 2013 and 2015. This has now increased to five times more likely in 2019. The Embrace project in 2018 reported that there's an increase of neonatal mortality and stillbirth in babies of Asian or Asian British ethnicity, which has risen from 38% risk to a 66% risk between 2014 and 2016. In non-white women, there's a 1.5 chance of being affected by serious complications such as acute fatty liver of the pregnancy, amniotic fluid embolism, antenatal pulmonary embolism, eclampsia and peripartum hysterectomy. The risk remains higher after you adjust for age, socioeconomic background, smoking, smoking status, parity and body mass index. 
As for black and black British babies, the risk in 2019, the risk has remained at a constant high of 121% of being born from stillbirth and a 50% risk, a 50% risk increase from dying of neonatal birth compared to babies from white ethnic groups. So in 2010, as I said, this isn't news. In 2010, there was an NPEU study and it found that black and ethnic minority women report more negative experiences than white women. Furthermore, they're less likely to report being treated with kindness or spoken to using terms they understand by healthcare professionals. Black and ethnic mothers have also reported lower confidence in healthcare professionals treating them, and they believe that the healthcare professionals treating them don't always have or make the best decisions regarding their care. Things aren't getting better for our black mothers and babies in the face of COVID. As we learned from earlier slides, how COVID is how COVID-19 is disproportionately affecting the black community, black mothers and babies are facing a double-pronged attack. Nuffield Department of Health and Oxford University conducted the UCA study from the March the 1st to the 14th of April 2020. From 427 pregnant women admitted to hospital with confirmed COVID-19 cases, 56% of these women that were admitted were from black and minority backgrounds. We need to ask ourselves why is this happening and how we can prevent this so we won't lose colleagues like nurse Mary Adjuapong. So the question now lies, why is this happening to our black mothers and babies? This is a multifaceted question, included, includes contributions of genetics, socioeconomics, environmental and psychological factors. For possible reading, reasons, possible reasons, we also need to look at the care being provided and the healthcare system. From the literature, there appears to be six prominent themes which serves as an as an explanation of why this is happening. Firstly, prejudice, so myths and colonization. So myths about tougher skin and about pain thresholds are large drivers of this or appear to be large drivers. So Janet Flea, a senior midwife and professional policy advisor comments, prejudice amongst midwives is a crucial factor in the deaths of black mothers. Black women are categorized according to the white perspective. They're not believed. This notion of them having a higher threshold for pain and these biases mean that we miss serious conditions or the opportunity to escalate serious changes in women's conditions in a timely manner. Next, medical education. Medical education often face focuses on white patients. Geography, local demographics may decrease your chance of encountering patients from all ethnic backgrounds. However, textbooks, lectures, case studies are still mostly focused on the white patient. This does not give students, future healthcare professionals and current professionals the ability to understand the differences. People have a standard profile in their head, a one size fits all. Usually a white, blonde eyed, blue eyed patient when we're talking about mothers. And this can cause, this causes a lack of cultural competency for healthcare professionals. Number three and number four. So shying away talking about race and internal bias. As a society, we often find it hard to discuss racism and Britain's dark colonial history and internal biases. So Dr. Christina Ketchy, a consultant Obzingani OBGYN commented, as a country, we find it hard to talk about race because we do not acknowledge the history of racial bias and racism and how some of these fragments still exist in our institutions. We can't talk about negative biases and others behaviors that may impact our cares. People find it hard to acknowledge racism and implicit bias in healthcare because they think it means by extension that they're delivering racist care. Next, we have research. There isn't enough research or studies conducted with minority groups or focused on minority groups. And finally, when they are, we are not quick to act on this data. Institutions are quick to draw conclusions, such as the Embrace studies about how black women are five times more likely to die of childbirth, but there's not been enough strategies or policies implemented to act on these shocking findings. And as a result, 
the, these problems are being perpetrated and these statistics are increasing. Mental health. So black and African Caribbean people are more likely to be diagnosed with schizophrenia, 10 to 18 times more likely, or psychosis. They're more likely to receive harsher treatment when in care, and in this harsher treatment, they're more likely to be tranquilized and not receive psychotherapy or counseling. Furthermore, black and, Af black and African Caribbean individuals are regarded as violent, and as a result, they're more likely to be locked in wards or have longer stay on medium secure care. The charity Mind has also found that black and African individuals have poorer outcomes after care. Black people are more likely to be detained under the Mental Health Act. We need to ask ourselves, why is this happening? Could it be systemic racism and discrimination? Consequently, consequently, racism, albeit implicit, is often ingrained within the fabric of many institutions. This stems from their colonial history. Socioeconomic disparities, which can often propagate racial stereotypes and cultural barriers to seeking effective care. Black individuals are often stigmatized from other racial groups as well as their own, which also has an impact on black mental health care. We have now highlighted the cracks in our care system for our black and BAME patients. It is now our responsibilities to our patient as healthcare professionals to rectify these disparities within our field to improve patient care and outcomes. Strategies we can deploy are as simple as having conversations about race and health inequalities to build understanding, empathy, and better care for our patients. Secondly, we can lend our voices to signing petitions or writing to our local MPs to drive causes such as the change.org's petition to diversify the medical curriculum. So as a result of these changes, we have a more culturally competent healthcare professionals. We can do bystander training. I think I can safely say we all agree that racism on, at any level is unacceptable. We need to educate ourselves for personal growth and being able to tackle the problem. But you also have a responsibility to ensure your students feel able to speak up if they find themselves in situations on placement, in a classroom or any other location where they're witness to any racial injustice. Think of ways you can try and incorporate this essential lesson into future teaching you give. By speaking up and calling people out on unacceptable behaviour, you're being an active ally. Supporting those on the receiving end of any incidents in the workplace will act as a catalyst for others to change their behaviour, which will have wide reaching positive impacts for all of our colleagues. Diversifying the curriculum simply means expanding the curriculum to be inclusive and intersectional. Having a diverse curriculum is essential to highlight the often ignored contributions of marginalized people in academia and expanding our thinking outside of the white by default narrative. This doesn't involve creating an entirely new canon overnight, but rather involves learning about different perspectives and developing the canon um, even further. Reporting systems are important and often um, overcomplicated or not properly used. We need effective reporting systems to ensure that if an incident was to take place, it can be logged and relevant actions or changes can come into effect to ensure that that doesn't happen again. Racism should not be a norm. Racism is a matter of organisational culture. And culture is a matter of leadership. Thank you guys for listening. We hope you've been able to learn something and this makes you reflect on your practice and what you can do to help not only our black patients, our BAME patients, but also our BAME and black students. You can find us here. I've been Anne O'Shodi. I'm Tito Alanio. And I'm Phoebe Kotler. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.